My name is David Dekrup. I'm a postdoc with uh, Mark Hannington at the University of Ottawa, and we're working on the uh, VMS subproject 3B over here, um, which is dealing with the statistical unraveling of crustal evolution uh, that is expressed in VMS trace element geochemistry. At least that is our, our current focus. During the last meeting, um, we presented a bit of a proof of concept. I will uh, recap that uh, just to bring everybody up to speed and then um, give everybody a bit of an update on um, what we've done so far and what the plans are going forward. The primary, uh, the primary question in this project is really uh, what we can learn about regional fertility and melogeny from uh, trace element fingerprinting of VMS ore. And this question really ties directly into uh, the Craton and Transect work that we heard about last week. And I will also give some context about that connection shortly. Um, two underlying concepts really needed to be tested before we could get to work. And the first one of that is uh, how enrichments and depletions are actually consistent among deposits um, and districts um, and how they are not just locally controlled. Um, so are we seeing a regional scale in the VMS geochemistry or are local processes dominant? And then the second concept was to uh, identify what kind of signatures are indicative of conditions that are favorable for base metal deposition. And that ties directly into uh, what Jacob and uh, Priyal are working on. So this is really uh, sitting at, in the middle of, um, of our efforts here. Uh, we started out uh, combining legacy data and uh, archived samples uh, based on a recent GSC open file, and we now about doubled um, the size of that original database to include a, a representative number of deposits, um, VMS deposits in Canada. And the focus of our work is obviously on the EBITB, um, and half, uh, more than half of the analyses that we have in the database are from EBITB VMS deposits. There are still some gaps in our coverage, and we're working actively to close those gaps um, together with our VMS, uh, with our Metal Earth uh, collaborators, trying to obtain some samples. And uh, we're running currently running new um, analyses and preparing samples to achieve better coverage here on this map. Um, for the general concept, um, we've known for quite a while uh, that large-scale crustal and temporal variations are represented in at least copper, uh, lead, and zinc ratios in VMS deposits, where the majority of our key in VMS deposits plot on a, on a copper-zinc line and are, are very, very low in, um, in lead. Uh, however, there are even in the Archaea and a couple of districts that are notably enriched in uh, in, link, um, in things like uh, lead, but also silver. And this strongly hints at uh, some crustal differences, such as uh, early arc-like assemblages and cratinization, uh, compared to more primitive greenstone assemblages. And those differences are matched by uh, lead isotope data. We've already seen that last week during um, the transect and crate on scale projects. So this is not something um, where we are just dumping, jumping into the deep end, but uh, these, these kinds of patterns have already been observed. We're just trying to find out what kind of patterns we can see mirrored in the actual VMS. Um, these processes are also reflected on the CAMP scale, where we can see some clear differences. For example, here, the arsenic contents from sulfides uh, in sulfides from the Noranda CAMP are pretty consistently averaging around 100 ppm, uh, which many, with many samples are much, much lower than that. But as soon as we step out of the Noranda main CAMP, uh, arsenic concentrations in sulfides drastically increase. Uh, first in the cycle four deposits here, Delbridge and Milgren, um, and then throughout the deposits at Busquet and in Valdor, uh, with the average concentrations of arsenic closer to 1000 ppm. This is in part, but obviously not entirely, reflective of uh, host drop differences, and this suggests a more fundamental crustal differences than what we have seen um, uh, uh, and uh, which we are testing um, if we see that same process reflected in other elements. Um, this arsenic, staying with the arsenic example for now, um, we do see temporal trends in, um, um, in half a dozen district, districts in the Superior Province. They show a large range of arsenic, uh, but um, at the same time, um, still being a fair bit lower than what we see in deposits uh, that are Proterozoic or Paleozoic in age. Within the Archean, um, districts, there are differences that are linked to if we are in a mafic dominated or felsic dominated um, um, camp. But even though um, uh, districts like Busquet, Valdor and Sturgeon Lake are more felsic, we still see a lot less uh, arsenic 
in those VMS ores than we do in younger deposits. We think this, uh, this is going to tell us something about the, uh, the crustal influence and possibly the fertility in different districts. And we're now testing how this observation holds up on different scales. Uh, we're already seeing similar trends in uh, silver, lead, and antimony. antimony. Uh, and in this example, um, for different um, for the different stages of abitibi ages, each element from young to old uh, is showing different degrees of influence of more juvenile host rocks and more evolved crust, very similar to the trends that we've seen on Friday in the lead isotope work um, overall in the uh, superior. And we're now exploring the same kind of um, spatial and temporal trends for uh, 30 to 40 other elements in the data set, uh, including with uh, multivariate statistics and machine learning approaches. Um, one of those uh, examples I picked out here, it's uh, more or less random, um, but it pretty nicely shows um, a simple um, element, uh, simple element concentrations, um, how simple element concentrations are a bit limited in what we can learn. And uh, multivariate statistics really allow us to, um, um, to limit the dimensionality of our data. So in this case, uh, principal component analyses, but also algorithms like TSNE um, allow us to um, project the variability in a data set onto a 2D or a 3D space and um, allow us to understand the data much more um, than we could if we look at simple, um, uh, at simple things like box, box plots or, um, or uh, simple other um, XY plots. Um, these statistical um, tools like Mark Fassbender earlier alluded to just make complex data sets and the information include them much more easy to grasp. This PCA plot here is, um, one that includes a couple of elements that are indicative of crustal development. And the immediate observations are that the more felsic deposits have a positive PC2 loading and cluster around uh, lead, um, antimony, um, a little bit less so arsenic and zinc. So these triangles here are uh, the more felsic dominated um, um, deposits, whereas the, uh, the um, circles and uh, the rectangles down here are the more mafic dominated um, deposits. And so this positive PC2 loading um, already tells us that um, we've got to be very careful um, of how we compare um, our data and what we plot because multivariate anal analyses will always pick out and react to the greatest variability in a data set first, which in this case here is controlled by the host drop. So much of um, the positive PC2 loading is controlled by, um, by the more felsic host drops. And uh, it's important that we compare the same kind of deposits to filter out those variabilities that we already know. Um, and so to allow us to identify what we don't know yet. Um, mineralogy is another example of um, what controls the variability. In this case here, an example is uh, zinc and cadmium, where cadmium uh, substitutes into the svalerite lattice. And um, that tells us that we just have to be very careful in filtering out our results. So this here was an earlier step of the PCA uh, from which we learned and iteratively um, improved our, um, our data coverage and analysis. Um, so we're trying to really compare um, examples that are comparable. We could try to compare apples to apples. So for example, we're picking pyrite separates from deposits hosted in bimodal felsic um, host rocks um, to take out as much variation of known um, characteristics um, as we can. But two major points that we needed to test are uh, still visible and, um, and shown in these kinds of plots. One um, was that um, in intra deposit variation is limited if we compare the, the entire data set. So in this case, here I highlighted our um, data points from Delbridge, and they do cluster fairly closely together. Even though we only have three samples here, it's pretty clear that um, they're not all over the place, but contained in a small area of the, um, of the, of the field. And um, this effect here is, is evident um, in a tight clustering um, for, for all the deposits that we, um, that we analyzed. Um, and it can be broken down to a fairly simple and maybe a bit oversimplified um, 
concept that is that um, any pyrite from an antimony rich deposit will always be more enriched in antimony than any pyrite from an antimony poor deposit. So of course there is going to be intra deposit variation, but uh, for our purposes here, we can basically take any sample from a deposit and it will have characteristics that are unique to that deposit. Um, a similar grouping holds true for uh, district scales. In this case, we have four deposits from the Metagamy mining camp and all samples from individual deposits cluster closely together and the entire district um, forms a cluster or a trench. So um, these, these deposits here are individual deposits from Metagamy and the entire group is the Metagamy mining camp. Um, and it is pretty clear that there is something unique to this camp, um, and we're trying to link that to the crust of processes, similar to what Mark Fassbender uh, was talking about earlier. So this is the second validation of concepts that uh, deposits in the same districts are geochemically related, and we're now trying to figure out how they are related and what controls the changes and the trends within districts. Um, so this is the stage that we're at right now. Um, we were able to show all the underlying controlling mechanisms we needed to, and we're now um, turning our results into a spatial overlay of element enrichments um, that are significant indicators of crustal evolution and cretinization, uh, but also for uh, regional fertility. Uh, we're currently working on turning this information into a spatial temporal map, um, kind of an overlay for the EBITB and the superior in general, um, while also filling gaps in the database by advancing our sampling and analytical effort. And that's it for now. I'll throw it back to you, Harold. Thank you. Thanks, David. Any questions for the group? I would just like to make an appeal to the folks doing some of the, the geochemical, especially the trace element geochemical stuff, to try to deliberately uh, include multiple elements that have uh, radiogenic isotopic relevance. Uh, for instance, the last one had lead in that would help one to start understanding some of the lead isotope stuff. But we also need to cross check it with other isotope systems, to try and get the time constraints as well as the geochemical constraints. I realize it's not always, it's generally going to be pretty difficult to do that. But if there is any way that the folks doing the geochemical part can include other elements that have radiogenic isotope relevance, please do. Thanks. Well, Harold, thanks. Thanks for, and all the VMS guys, thanks very much for the presentations and, uh, uh, thanks for everybody's interest and attendance.